Good day, everyone. Uh, glad that you could join us for this webinar from EDA Technologies. I am Nishan Naika, and today we will be discussing cost optimization, specifically looking at the PCB panel size and how to optimize it. So once again, thanks for making yourself available, and I hope that we'll be able to share information with you that uh, will assist you to um, save costs and uh, also to be able to design PCBs in a manner that will be more profitable to the company. Excellent. So let me go to the next slide. So just by way of introduction, uh, we know that many of you have been dealing with EDA for many years and nice to see some old names uh, in the attendee list. So um, you, you know much about EDA already, but uh, just by way of reminder uh, and maybe some updates. So over the years, EDA has been doing all sorts of things related to PC boards, um, but recently we've really entered into our niche, uh, excuse the pun, and uh, you know we're focusing on these core services. So uh, training and consultancy remains an important part of our business. And I'll speak to you a bit later about uh, a new uh, portal that we've created called Tracks and Gaps. And uh, it's a specialized portal giving uh, training courses on PCB manufacturing, PCB design, and so on. And we've gathered experts from around the world to offer this training. So that's some uh, very exciting development on our side. Of course, you know that we sell LTM Designer. Many of you are using LTM, and uh, we continue to support this class leading tool. We also offer specialist PCB design services. Um, so really high tech boards, high speed, high power requirements um, and so on. If you have any of those requirements, uh, please feel free to shout. And then of course we manufacture PCBs. We have been doing for, for uh, at least over two decades and we represent a company called NCAB, Nordic Circuits AB and we'll chat about that a bit later on. So essentially that's what EDA is about, but we, we really eat, drink, sleep PCBs. And that's, that's where we uh, fit into the industry and that's where uh, we'd like to offer as much services to you as possible. Excellent, so please um, contact us if you need any assistance with advanced topics such as PCB stack ups. Uh, just this week we did a stack up for a local customer, um, 30, 32 layer PCB with a Panasonic M6 material, blind and buried wires with stacked wires, uh, very, very complicated stack up. And that's our speciality. We can do very complex stack ups uh, locally. We can give you real time support on that. Material choice is very important and we'll discuss that in detail during this webinar. Uh, we can also assist you with high speed layouts and especially now you're going to USB uh, 3.0 and also much faster uh, transmission speeds on PC boards, we can really assist you with it. So if you have any of these requirements, give us a shout. We've got uh, experience and knowledge to be able to assist you on the fly to help you get your design right the first time. But today we're talking about uh, cost optimization. Now, this is an extremely uh, valuable topic uh, considering the times we're living in. The, the cost of PCBs are going through the roof and it's mainly because of the cost of the raw materials. So because you're a large percentage of your actual PCB cost is uh, because of the PCB raw material itself, one needs to really optimize the usage of that raw material um, to select the best material that is currently available. And then once you've got that material to utilize the maximum area on that panel as possible so that you waste as little as possible. This is very, very important now because there's such a war going on regarding PCB material. So as EDA Technologies, we like to keep our customers uh, informed of international developments. Um, late last year, we issued a press release notifying all our customers of uh, international PCB price increases. 
That was in December. Now we're seeing this happen. The prices are going very high. Lead times are going through the roof. Um, and it is definitely something that uh, we for, saw beforehand and forewarned all our customers. And, and so this makes this topic all the more so more important because we need to make sure that we optimize the cost and uh, reduce the effect of the price increase that we're feeling at the moment. So material choice is, is really critical. Um, you know, for instance, uh, at the moment, it's very hard to get uh, two ounce and three ounce laminates, very, very hard. The reason for that is there's a shortage of copper foil and the big boys are buying up the material, which means that the smaller manufacturers are scrambling to fight for what's left and the prices are very high and uh, lead times are very high. So one has to choose the material very, very carefully. And this is where as EDA, we can give you a lot of advice and support in choosing the best material that's available and that uh, fits the purpose or the function of your design. So we can look at the thermal trade off versus signal integrity performance, and then choose a material there or group of materials that could do the job. And then from those group of materials, we will then um, speak to our manufacturer and find out what's the best available from that group of materials and then assist you to uh, select the right material. So this is becoming extremely important. You have to work with your manufacturer upfront instead of having a big surprise at the end of the day. And uh, it, it's not about just choosing a material. It's easy to Google it, find a few uh, materials or data sheets and design your PCB accordingly, but that doesn't help anyone. First of all, your manufacturer needs to have experience with that specific material. He needs to, your manufacturer needs to have processes in place to deal with that material uh, because materials behave differently under pressure and under different temperatures. So you'll notice from this chart from NCAB on the far right, there's an application status. Um, a means it's a manufacturing product. B, uh, they can do it, but in sample quantities. C, it's, going, it's almost finished with the evaluation and so on. So that is why you can't just pick any material. We need to make sure that when we do choose a material, what a level of experience does the manufacturer have with that material? And if we're doing a 32 layer board, will they be able to laminate and produce that PCB successfully at the best yield? At the end of the day, if they don't have experience with the material, you're going to pay for it because they will have to factor in some uh, trial and error runs to uh, until they can get your PCB right. So keep that in mind, uh, choosing the material, working with your supplier um, to choose the, the best material and also to look at what the lead time is for that material. Okay. Um, I, and then um, still talking about material choice, uh, we see that uh, for instance, we did a stack up for a customer. It was a 14 layer PCB. Uh, while choosing material is important and to make sure your supplier has got experience with that material, you should also keep in mind that if you choose a specific material, in this case, we chose the Panasonic Mag 6, but even in that range of materials, you still have different thicknesses of laminates and sheets. So while you choose a material, you also need to check with the manufacturer, do they normally stock this thickness of core? They might come back and say, you know what, we don't normally stock a 0.1 millimeter uh, Mag 6 core, we stock a 0.12 um, thickness core. So that's why it becomes very, very complicated when it comes to multi-layers, uh, especially in this time now, to choose the right material that's available and that the manufacturer that does stock. So I threw these slides in because it has a very significant effect on the cost of your final product. So let's, let's dig in a little bit deeper into the actual PCB panel size now. We often get uh, designs in from customers for manufacture and we get something that looks like what you see on the left hand side. So you notice um, in that 
panelization that there's an exorbitant amount of wasted material. So if this was, for instance, a 10 layer PCB, you actually paying all the fees to throw away material. And that's a, a huge waste of money. So a question you need to ask is, is it necessary to penalize the PCB the way I'm doing it? It might look good. It, you might think that it's easy for handling and so on, but is it really necessary? Why do I need so much area in the break off strip? Uh, another good question is, is there a valid reason to do the penalization in house? Why am I doing it? Is not the manufacturer the best person to penalize? So why am I doing it in house? And you should have a good reason for doing that. We'll cover a few more points regarding this later on, but this is a very important factor. There was one customer we assisted uh, last year with optimized cost optimization and uh, we reduced the break off strips and the gaps between panels and so on and we actually fitted 36 percent more pcbs on that panel that's a huge amount of money that's being saved so keep that in mind is it really necessary for me to do it what's driving me to want to do it in-house um, and if i do have to do it in-house due to various reasons you know um, how, how you penalize it is extremely important remember that the manufacturer always works with panels so you might design a small little pcb but it has to go on a much bigger panel and they then um, put some uh, tooling holes and other markings on the panel so that they can uh, go through the processes so for instance you see there's a plating line here they will hang a whole lot of panels on here and the the plating line will move the panels through the various processes and uh, to, to get the plating done, for instance. So there's, the manufacturer always works with panels, um, no matter how big or small the PCB you design, they will want to put it onto a panel. So if you design the panel, it's your panel. It doesn't mean that it's gonna go just like that into the factory. Within the factory panel, they will try and place a number of your panels within that panel. And if you haven't done that right, you're going to end up wasting quite a lot of material. And at the end of the day, you pay for it. So remember with a reputable company like NCAB that we represent, uh, you, you, um, uh, they, they don't nest different PCBs on one panel. So some manufacturers do that to save money. They take a job from your company plus a job from another company, put it all onto one panel, uh, manufacture it and then split the boards and give each one its PC boards. So with NCAB, they never ever do that. Your boards are always on your panel and it's always consistent from batch to batch. So if you design your panel wrong and there's a lot of wasted space, space you are paying for it ultimately. So sometimes a customer asks us for a quote for 10 boards and for 20 boards. And the basket price at the end of the day is exactly the same for 10 or 20 because you have to use a panel in any case. And whether you're making 10 or 20, if 20 fits on a panel, you're paying for that whole panel in any case. You're just not getting the benefit of the quantity 20. So keep that in mind. And that's why this is such an important discussion. So when it comes to panel sizes, uh, there's sort of an industry standard globally for raw material size. So when a manufacturer buys the laminate sheets from a supplier like Shenyi or iTech uh, or Isola, uh, Rogers or whatever, it comes in uh, a raw incoming material size. So it's typically 48 inches by 36 inches. Um, that's just because that's um, how it's uh, generic, uh, historically been uh, measured. So it comes in as a fairly large sheet, typically packed on a flat surface. Um, and uh, when the material is needed, it's taken out of a temperature controlled area um, because fiberglass uh, is uh, prone to absorb moisture. So it has to be in a very controlled area. When they need it, they will take that sheet out and then they will use it on your product or on a project. So keep that in mind. Um, so what the manufacturer does is, it's extremely difficult to work with big sheets, especially if the laminate thickness is very thin, like 0.1 millimeter. You can imagine how flimsy that panel is. 
So what they do is they, they cut up the big incoming panel into smaller panels. And uh, they could cut it up into four panels. So if you've got a very long PCB, um, they might need to only cut that incoming panel into four working or production panels and then uh, place your PCB um, on that production panel. Uh, but typically, what a lot of manufacturers do is they cut it up into eight sheets. So that one incoming sheet is cut into eight sheets. Each one is 12 by 18 inches. It's a lot more workable, easier to handle, uh, so on. And also, if there's a damage on one of the panels, let's say a scratch or plating defect, uh, it's it's cheaper to scrap a smaller panel than to scrap the larger panel uh, and waste all that material. So that's why the manufacturers prefer to work on smaller panel sizes. So this is an important uh, this is important information because you need to design your panel or your PCB around the size, um, but not entirely around this. This is just a production uh, panel. It doesn't mean that you can use all that space. Remember. The manufacturer still has to put some tooling holes and markings and alignment pins and so on. So some of that space is wasted. So when it comes to the recommended uh, size of the panel, you can see that it's 12 inches by 18 inches. And uh, based on that, you know, um, you can see that if you're going to put two PCBs on this panel, then there's a maximum size you can use for your PCB, allowing the manufacturer space for tooling holes and so on. So if you can fit two PCBs on that panel, maximum is 207 by 264 or a subset of that. So if your PCB is gonna be, let's say 100 by 200, uh, 250, that means you'll get two, two PCBs on this panel with a little bit of wastage, which is not too bad. Uh, but if your PCB is a lot smaller, you might want to even tweak the PCB size so that you can fit another row of PCBs in that panel. So that's very important in terms of maximizing your, um, your panel size uh, uh, during your design process. So if you design your panel wrong or poorly, you, you're going, let's say for instance, you do a PCB of 100 by 160 and you put some big break off strips right around the board um, and you give that Gerber file to us. Our manufacturer then has to try and optimize and place a number of your panels on the working panel and to try and maximize how much they can get out of it, which they will always do. But because you've panelized one on a panel with massive break-off strips, you might only be able to fit um, you know, two uh, of your customer panels onto one array which means that there's a lot of wastage of, of space. That is why we, we really suggest, if you don't have to penalize it in-house, don't. Uh, let the manufacturer do that, and um, you can even instruct them where to put your tooling holes and fiducials, and they will easily do that. So it's important to, to look at your PCB size, redesign it, tweak uh, the distances if you have to, maybe even design a template in Altium uh, with the maximum size and the usable size so that when you are creating your PCB, you can play around with the size to maximize how many PCBs you would be able to get on a panel. So with a little bit of effort up front, you can actually contribute to price reduction down the line. So in terms of good utilization, you can see that if you just penalize it a little bit differently, change the break of strip size and so on, you can maximize. There's always going to be some waste, always. But in this case, just by changing a few things, you can get 78.2% um, uh, yield, which means that 11.8% um, is wasted. And that's, that's, um, that's expected that there will be some waste. What we do as EDA is we've got a template drawing that we've given to our manufacturer, and we give them some guidelines. So for instance, this is the maximum panel size we want to work in. And it could be because of the pick and place machine. So it doesn't help you get a massive PCB back, but it doesn't fit in your pick and place machine. So in-house, you may want to have certain rules or parameters within which the manufacturer can work. So that's what we've done. We've said, you know what, go wild with your panelization, do it how you think is best, 
but work within these parameters. And we just give the document once to NCAB and they apply to all the designs we send. So we don't need to spend hours and days penalizing and putting fancy break off strips. It's not necessary anymore because the manufacturer gives you back the working Gerber file in any case. You will get a penalized uh, paste file back in any case. So there's no problem with worrying about, you know, if there's offsets in terms of making a stencil and that you will get the information back. So put as much information as you can on your fab notes uh, layer and uh, give the manufacturer enough information so that everyone is clear and the panel will be within your requirements. LTM is a very nice feature to, uh, to nest PCBs and to penalize it automatically for you. So instead of you dumping multiple boards and, and drawing and spending a lot of time, you just need to put in some parameters and it will do it for you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to hand over to Luke, our resident expert on Altium. And Luke is going to just do a short demo of how the embedded board array feature works in Altium and how you can also nest a, diff a few different designs if need be so that you can maximize the usage of a panel. Um, and, and instead of making two panels, you can put all the different boards of a project on one panel especially if you're going to make small quantities of uh, that design. So let me hand over to Luke at this point. All right, there we go. So I'm going to be showing you how to use Altium's embedded board arrays and search for panelization. For this example, I'm going to be using one of our own projects that we've used, uh, that we designed in-house for one of our own products. And I'm also going to be using the Xilinx Spartan board that is included with your Altium installation, just to make it easier so that if you want to experiment, you can experiment with a uh, controlled board. So um, one thing that's important with um, Altium's embedded board array is that it uses only one stack up for the entire array. So you'll need to make sure that any boards that you're putting together, if, especially if you're wanting to embed different projects together, is that they all need to have the exact same stack up. Otherwise, it's not going to work out very well because you can't exactly um, hand over a, a panel that's a 12-layer panel and a two-layer um, two board and a 12-layer board on the same panel. It's not really going to work out. So all the boards on a panel must be the same. Uh, in terms of stack up, but everything else about them can be different. So for this case, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a existing document that I've already pre-made for the embedded board array, because you'll see here that this is literally just the PCB. It's got nothing on the outside of it because any mechanical information or silk information that you put outside of the board dimensions will be imported with the uh, board array, which is not something that we'd want to happen in most cases. So I'm just quickly going to say add existing to project. And you'll see here that I've got, uh, let me just quickly go to the correct location. Uh, it's, it's e action at C there um, then it's users uh, public public documents Altium and then you can just go to your Altium project folder go to examples spirit level and you'll see here that uh, it's not there I forgot that I moved it to a temporary folder here quick Okay, just a second, let me find it. Uh, I can just quickly open it from recent documents. Uh, recent documents and there we go. Okay, couldn't find it. So what I'll do is I'll just quickly um, say save as, or I'll say save. So you go here, file, and then you want to save it as a save a copy of it as uh, let's just go to desktop I'll just save it to a separate location here quick 
So what I'm going to do is I'll give this one a name to identify that it's the panelized version. So I keep the board name exactly as is, and I just underscore add panel at the end of it. So I say save. And then what I can do is you'll see now that this is um, the original, which is not outside of the project, but I can say add new to project or add existing to project. And then I head over to that panel one that I just added, which is over here. Okay, and if I open it, you'll see that at the moment, it's exactly the same as the board that we just opened. So what I can do is I can select everything and just say delete. Yes, I want to delete everything. And now we've got a blank a PCB document with the exact same stack up as the original. So now what I can do is I can say place in board, embedded board array slash panelize. And you'll get this little green block that says no source. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put it on its on the origin point, and I double click it to open its uh, properties. And here where it says properties PCB document, this is which uh, board are you wanting to import into the settings. So what I'll do is I'll select it here, and I will go to the C users embedded. Uh, let's just quickly get the exact path of this. So let's explore here. And I copy here. And I select it here. And when I click on OK, you'll see that it's now opened up a embedded board array. But it's only one board at the moment. So what I can do is I can say, okay, I want to have, let's say, three rows. And you can see here now is where you decide the spacing between each board. So if I just click on OK now, you can see it's got a fair amount of spacing between each board. Now, this is generally what you would do if you're going to be, say, for instance, um, using mouse bytes to connect your various boards together. If, if that's how you're going to be doing it, or in the cases of where you're going to be only um, using v-scoring, what you can do is if you check your properties panel for the size of the PCB area, it's 180 by 50.5. All right, so if I set it here so that the um, column spacing is 50.511, and the row spacing, uh, just need to make sure that I've got it right here. Uh, vertical will be 50.511. So that is 50.511. You'll see now that the boards are, the board edges are meeting up perfectly with each other. So if, say for instance, I now want to um, make it so it's a three by two, I'll need to set it so that it's got two columns with a spacing of 180.011. So I'll double click on the array to open the, the properties here. Let's just do it there. Okay, and then column spacing is 180.011. And if I say I want two columns, there we go. Now that, that's relatively simple to do. And if I say, for instance, go to PCB uh, unit PCB boundary, which is what I called the PCB outline for this project, go into single layer view, you can see the, um, the layer exactly at, set up as you had it in the original PCB document. So I'm going to quickly switch over to one of the boards that we've done before for for EDA technologies, where I've panel where I've got it panelized as well, and I've got a single board as well. So let me just quickly switch over to these, and it opens. 
So you'll see on the single board, I've literally just got the design laid out. And then on our pre-made pre panel, I've got it as a two by five because we wanted 10 boards per panel. And on the, on the mechanical information on the panel, I indicate that these lines are going to be V score lines. This just lets the manufacturer know that these boards need to be V scored at these locations and that will assist in us breaking the boards apart. But now let's say I want to add um, another, another board to this. Like we're going to be making it so that there's um, the Xilinx board is going to be part of the whole panel. So what I can do is with the panel document selected here, you'll see here I've already got a board array. So what I'm going to do is I'll just shift this entire board array up here and let's just move everything here to, to match it. So I just select here just to give us a bit more space to work with. And with this mechanical one, select those just to move everything there. And now I want to say, for instance, put our Xilinx board underneath this. What I can do is I can say place embedded board array. And for this case, I want to select the Xilinx board. And here you can see now I have the Xilinx board in the same panel. Now, obviously you can see that these two panels don't really fit um, well together. So what, I can, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put this down and let's see, um, I think I can maybe fit in another two more of our boards here. So I'll increase the column count to seven. And you can see now that that's a better fit. So that's less material that would be wasted because as Nishan mentioned earlier, material wastage is a big concern. So the less material you waste, the better. Now, obviously these boards have to be V-scored apart, but the V-scoring can't go through this board. So we'll need to create a small gap for them to be able to V-score one set, but not the other. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just position this a short distance away. So uh, let's move this so that it matches. And then, so right there, and then select it, say move selection by X, Y and I'll move the Y offset by five millimeters. So now there's a five millimeter gap. Now, in order to add mouse bytes to connect these, what we can do is um, at EDA, we've made a few library components for mouse bytes. Uh, if I go to PCB, I believe it's under there. And here you go. We've got two by two millimeter double-sided or two by three millimeter double-sided. So if I bring this in, and I just hide the designation because it doesn't need one, here you can see our mouse bytes. So what I do is I say move selection, and I'll just put that there. And this I'm gonna just move up by two millimeters so it matches. So that goes up by two millimeters. Uh, that was three millimeters, so I'll just move it up an additional one. And it's not quite matching up. So what I'll do is I'll just bring it down to line up like that. So this way, um, we've now got our, uh, let's see, this actually needs to, this line needs to match up there or to be accurate. So. If I just grab this and I say move selection to there, move selection to there. Now you can see um, this is how our mouse, mouse bike would work. So what I can do is I can say copy here and I can just copy this a few times across on the board just to ensure that everything fits as it's supposed to. Obviously you'd set up your mouse bytes a little bit better than I'm setting up mine up right now, but this is just for illustrative purposes. So once you set up your mouse bytes like so, you'd need to now set up your board outline. So 
In order for everything to work correctly, we would then on mechanical one, we'd say place line. And you just do a quick trace of the extreme outer edges of your design. As a, just a quick example here, you go down like that, down to there, down to there, and just back to the origin. Okay, so now that we've got that, we just quickly select and we set our board to that shape. So now if I go like this, you can see that's a solid board. But obviously we need some routing going here. So what you can do is you can say view configuration and we add a mechanical layer quick. So you just say add a mechanical layer and we set the uh, mechanical layer type to route tool path and we'll put it on layer three or in this case we're going to use a different layer because I forgot I had something on mechanical three uh, so I'll put it on mechanical layer 30 for instance in this case and what I'll do is I will then select it here route to path and I'll just say place line and I'll set the line width to two millimeters so that it fits nice and centered. And you just essentially put down some mechanical lines to indicate where the routing goes. So what you can do is this, and you just set this these down into place. Like so, and I'll just show those two for now. And if I go into 3D view, you can, it should now be, uh, just a second here, so I select that. There we go. Now in 3D view, you can see your board has got the break or strips indicated as normal. And when you generate your gobers, you can then send this through to the manufacturer and they'll manufacture as per your gobers. So you can have multiple boards on the same panel in this manner. So that's just a quick way of how you can do uh, multiple boards on the same panel and how it's quick and easy to set up a panelization. However, as Nishan mentioned previously, if you, if you, if you don't, if you're not sure about the optimal panelization, you can just send us the gobers for a single board and allow us to handle the panelization from our side and we'll optimize the panelization and we'll send you all the paste data so that you guys can make your stencils for pick and place and such. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand back over to Nishan. So if I stop my sharing and back over to you, Nishan. Uh, excellent, Luke. Thanks very much for covering that information. It's actually very easy to use the embedded board array in LTM. It's a beautiful feature. And um, just by working smart with it, you can, you can literally save thousands and thousands of rands on your manufacturing and even your tooling costs. So uh, play around with that. If you're uh, struggling, uh, give us a shout. Luke can uh, help you with a one-on-one -on -one session. And uh, of course, we'd love to manufacture your PCBs as well. Very good. So, so just to touch on what Luke covered uh, a little bit in terms of mouse bites or v-grooving, uh, this is also quite an important subject when it comes to penalization. And there's pros and cons with using each one of those two. Um, so, for instance, if we are doing a PCB with uh, BGAs and uh, chip scale packages and so on, we prefer to use mouse bites. Uh, because then the force exerted on the panel when you de when you separate the PCBs from each other, you know you're not going to deform the uh, BGA balls, which cannot return to their previous shape. Um, so we prefer to use a V grooving tool to splice and to separate the PCBs. So keep that in mind when doing your panelization. There's also certain parameters you need to be aware of, like the depth of V grooving. If you make it too deep 
your PCB is going to be very flimsy in the pick and place machine. If you don't uh, do the webbing correctly, then it'll be very hard to uh, separate the boards afterwards. So NCAB has got a very good uh, standard. We can share with you that you can put some notes on your drawings to make sure the manufacturer follows that very carefully. And of course, if you want mouse bites and so on, you could do it manually like uh, Luke showed you, or you could leave it to the manufacturer. We give NCAB a drawing and a specification and we say penalize 10 on a panel or eight to 10 on a panel, whatever you think is best, add break off strips. And these are the, this is the spec for the break off strip. Simple, they do it, you get the working Gerbers back, you don't lose anything. You still have the IP in your single PCB. So um, keep that in mind. And uh, really, you know, the old days, you wanted to control everything in house. It's not always necessary. Um, let us handle that for you. So thanks very much for listening to, to this uh, webinar. If you have any questions, you're welcome to use the chat feature now. And uh, myself and Luke will um, try and assist you. Uh, we uh, represent NCAB Group, as we mentioned, and we've represented them for over 10 years. Uh, one of the most trusted PCB supply in the world um, with factories on all the major continents in the Northern Hemisphere, and we can handle any technology. So uh, 40 layer, 50 layer boards, blind and buried, laser drilling, uh, embedded capacitance boards, copper coin, you name it. We can do any technology from quantity one to tens of thousands. We also uh, widely support Altium, our tool of choice, most widely used PCB design tool in the world. Um, last year, they uh, reached a target of 51,000 active subscribers of Altium. That's 51,000 designers using Altium every day um, around the world. So uh, quite, a, uh, quite an achievement, but at the same time, Altium is very aggressive in bringing out new features and improvements all the time. So thanks for your support over the years in that. The, the great news that we mentioning you to you today is our new online PCB specialist training portal. So this is a portal for PCB specialists. It's not generic for all sorts of things. And we've uh, reached out to some of the experts that we've brought to South Africa over the years, like Lee Ritchie on high speed, and uh, we've assembled a number of short courses, which will be uh, kicking off very shortly. And uh, we've also got other experts from around the world that we will be delivering us a, a number of PCB specialist topics, such as thermal management, um, antenna design, and so on and so on. So please visit uh, the website tracksandgaps.com. And uh, it's there's still a little bit of work that's being done on the website, but you'll get an idea of where we're going. And, and so this opens up the training now, uh, because we can't travel due to uh, COVID, we can still have access to the world's best instructors. So this is an initiative from EDA, and it's a global portal that we are um, pushing out. Some of the courses we have coming up is a PCB masterclass. So it'll be three half day uh, uh, sessions covering everything from the basics of PCB manufacturing, design for manufacturability, material choices, impedance control, a whole lot of other subsets. So uh, be sure to look out for that PCB masterclass. All of these classes will uh, come with a certificate um, from, and also signed by the instructor or instructors. So this is something to look forward to going forward. So keep that in mind. Make sure that um, you look at the website as often as possible. We've also got a lot of online resources on our website, edatech. Oh, that should have been .co.za. Apologies for the typo. We'll fix it in the version that we're sharing. Um, but please feel free to visit our website to have a look at all those available resources. So we're very uh, thankful to NCAB for um, helping us to put together a number of these slides with regards to the optimum penalization of a PCB. Um, and uh, we certainly want to help you to reduce costs and to improve efficiency. So if you have any requirements, please give us a shout. Uh, we're here to help you. EDA has been around since 1997. Uh, we eat, drink, sleep PCB. So if we can help you in any way, we most certainly 
would like to do that. So thank you for attending today. We really appreciate your time. Um, I see there is a message. Okay, it's just a thank you message from Kobe. Thanks, Kobe, for attending. Uh, Kobe from Mixed Telematics uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, to everyone else, have a fantastic day. Please be safe. And if you'd like a, a copy of this uh, webinar, please reach out to Luke uh, with the address support at edatech.co.za. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.